You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ. And Pedro. Segwit set to activate in two weeks. Jalurida adapts platform for token sale. Crypto ICOs are set to overtake venture capital funding. And we have two special guests in the studio. All this and more in episode 218 here on August 9th, 2017. In traditional markets, we have gold uh, up to $1,275, silver up to $16.88, oil is down to $49.55, the Dow is up to $22,048, and the 30-year U.S. Treasury, Treasury yield is down to 2.822%. Thank you, Pedro. In the crypto markets, Bitcoin is up to $3,340, Bitcoin Cash is down to $317, Litecoin is up to $48.09. Ethereum is up to $299. And Dash is up to $200. Now, just a reminder, you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, Darren can't be with us today. However, we have two special guests in studio. I'd like to welcome Chris Pacia back to the show. Chris is the lead backend developer for Open Bazaar. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. We also have Michael Yakubovic uh, joining us. Yakubovic, I'm gonna, I got it right. Yakubovic joining us in studio. Michael is one of the co-hosts for the new podcast Neo Cash Crypto Radio in Russian. Welcome, Michael. Hi, glad to be here. Excellent, and congratulations on your second episode this week. Uh, put out, I believe, on Monday or Sunday. Comes out Monday. Monday. Excellent. So tune into that on neocashradio.com. Click the Russian language uh, language selector, and you can see all of the Neocash Crypto Radio in Russian. Excellent. So, Michael, uh, SegWit activation signaling is complete. They've, they've finished signaling for the SegWit. And on Tuesday of this week, with a block height of 479,707, the Bitcoin network signaled the activation of SegWit with 100% support from the miners. Early Wednesday morning. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what happened is the lock-in. Yes. So that they locked in the initial um, the initial uh, periods because it's always periods of, with with Bitcoin and whatnot. It's it's how many blocks over this period of time. So they, they locked in in the original lock-in back uh, with BIP one forty one. Uh, uh, 140, right. yeah. 141, yeah. Yep. And then that was to prevent the one forty eight user activated soft fork or hard fork, however you want to term it. Preempt it. Uh, yeah, preempt it. And now this is to actually uh, lock in the activation. And uh, so... T two weeks later, right. which is August right. 21st, the SegWit is officially part of the Bitcoin protocol. That's right. So so early Wednesday morning or this morning, uh, the two-week grace period began. And during this time, the miners, wallets, exchanges ought to prepare for the activation by upgrading their software and making sure that they are compatible. Now, as you mentioned, Michael, August 21st, uh, roughly around 2 p.m. is the estimated time, the uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I think. Now, it, it will differ based on when the actual block happens, but that's when the actual activation happens, and then SegWit blocks uh, can be created, and the blocks that do not signal SegWit properly will be rejected by the miners. That's the point in time, yeah. So can a, can a block signal SegWit but not have any SegWit transactions? Correct. It's optional. So the next steps include the implementation of the Lightning Network and then the doubling of the size of the blocks. Now, it seems based on some of the, the Twitter activity, and I don't like to base too much off of Twitter activity, but it seems like the, the effort is sort of going to be focused first on the Lightning Network with the block size increase sort of put to the back burner. Now, we don't know yet because the, the GitHub isn't exactly giving us a clear uh, idea, right? Well, um, the miners are free to use SegWit and construct SegWit blocks starting on the 21st. So at that time, they can move the witness data into the extra space and give us effectively 1.7 megabyte blocks, which is optional again. But they can do that without lightning, without any other features. Right. I guess I'm I'm speaking to the SegWit X2 portion of the the X2 portion of it, which uh, will, will come. I, I don't know what point in time, but it will. And the this the lightning November. network November. So, some current stats for the Bitcoin network include the 
Network hash rate is rising over 7 billion terahashes. So this, this gives us an indication that no real mining power has shifted from the uh, Bitcoin network to the Bitcoin cash network. The blocks are coming out slightly over 10-minute intervals. The blocks are coming out nearly full with an average of 0.95 megabytes. The mempool is 46 million bytes in size, or roughly 46 full blocks, and that will change day by day during the week. The Bitcoin network is currently handling about 255,949 transactions per day. So if the network hash rate continues to go up in, in Bitcoin, where is Bitcoin Cash getting its hash rate? New miners? That's the thing. Is, is what, We'll talk a moment about Bitcoin Cash. Um, That's possible. There's, you know, it's also interesting that um, I, the, the relative profitability of mining Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin is kind of going to determine how much hashing power they, they get. I've heard a theory. I don't know if it's going to play out or not but the the bitcoin cash um you know the bitcoin difficulty is going to go up um you know shortly and the bitcoin cash difficulty is going to go down and it's possible that that might actually make bitcoin cash a little bit more pro profitable or maybe not a little bit but a lot more profitable in the short term like in the next couple of weeks to mine bitcoin cash relative to bitcoin and if people switch their hash power from bitcoin to bitcoin cash this could cause regular bitcoin blocks to start coming slower um, if that happens. So that'll be interesting to look out for and see if that actually happens or not. Right, right. It, it, it is, you know, well, let's let's just quick talk about the Bitcoin Cash. Thanks to Coin.Dance, there have been 330 my, uh, blocks mined since the hard fork. They are 951 blocks behind the original chain. The Bitcoin Cash blockchain is currently operating at 13% of the original chain's difficulty. So this is something to note is that since our last show, they've had a lot of those 20% difficulty adjustments happen to bring that difficulty down. Uh, the original chain has grown uh, 1,039 megabytes more than the Bitcoin Cash blockchain and is currently 27% more profitable to mine on Bitcoin than Bitcoin Cash. So that's Yeah, and see, that's going down because it was just like a day or two ago, it was like 50-something percent. Um, right. Yeah. So it's well, kind of balancing I, out. I, I mean, there's there's two ways to look at this. One is that a lot of these miners have agreed to the New York agreement, the New York consensus, and their support for Bitcoin uh, Segwit 2X is is well known. I mean, and and they there is a sort of like uh, sort of honorable position of of supporting your consensus with this this roadmap and sticking with the uh, the Bitcoin core. Uh, plan and looking at the Bitcoin cash blocks, a lot of these blocks are mined by unknown uh, pools or entities. You know, they're not, you, if you look at that's one stark difference between the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin cash chains is that the blocks coming out for Bitcoin are clearly this pool, that pool, you know, the, the, the known pools. And when you look at the Bitcoin cash blocks, a lot of them, it's, it, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know, really so, know so, who's mining So maybe them. there's a lot of speculation going on. Uh, you know, maybe people have some Gen 1 to uh, ASICs that are bringing them back online mining Bitcoin Cash. And while it's still not profitable uh, and even less profitable so than compared to Bitcoin, maybe what they're doing is speculating that uh, at some point things will even out and Bitcoin yeah. Cash price will go up. That's the only reason I can yeah, think of. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of those machines sitting out there, you know, collecting dust um, that people probably did dust off. Yeah, I mean, and that's I think that's one thing that we're we might be seeing here is the the older generation ASICs coming online for Bitcoin Cash, and so like nowadays it doesn't make sense to run anything <clears throat> um, without the latest technology simply because you're you're not getting the efficiency, but you know it's it's just a different. But it is speculation, right? It, because, it is gambling. Because yeah. if it doesn't pan out, then you've just spent a lot of money on electricity. Well, I mean, in, in the same... Okay, so the, the, being realistic here, both the SegWit um, uh, changes and the Bitcoin Cash changes, the, the changes on both blockchains, both have their own sort of set of risks, right? There, there could be flaws in the code with, with either one of these things. There could be any number of, of uh, issues. Like you mentioned the, the, the mining difficulty for the Bitcoin chain. Now... The, the Bitcoin Cash chain has the, the sort of 51% attack uh, vulnerability, you know? So, like, there's, you know, it's sort of like right now, 
these two bitcoins are both doing well in their own right, but they're all both, um, you know, I guess, I guess really the, the Bitcoin, well, they're, they're competing with each other definitely on, on hash rate because you can use the same hardware equipment on either. So I, I, I think there's a, a fair amount of speculation, but that's not going to last forever. Right. I mean, people that are running a old ASICs on Bitcoin cash at some point are going to need to see that it's starting to become profitable either because the price is going up or the hash rate is, is, is better for them. Um, so yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see because all the other altcoins don't use, you know, shot, shot two. Right. Yeah, it, it is. It's definitely an experiment. Michael, what, what's your sort of thoughts on the SegWit, the future of, of that roadmap and whatnot? What are your, what are your thoughts? Uh, I just want to come back to Bitcoin Cash for a moment. Sure. As, as you discussed the difficulty and the hash rate, uh, that ultimately determines security of the chain. And at this point, it looks like um, we're talking about tens or maybe hundreds of petaf- petahash in the Bitcoin Hash network. And we're talking about thousands um, maybe peta hash in the Bitcoin network. So the security of one is vastly different than the security of the other. So 51% attack, transaction, changing transactions, orphaning blocks, things like that. The Bitcoin cash network is much more susceptible, maybe 100 times as susceptible to the main Bitcoin network because of the low difficulty and because of few machines mining it. Right. Comparatively. Right. Yeah. So it, it is definitely an early phase in, in which... You know, you are speculating. You are speculating on the price of Bitcoin Cash. You're speculating on it going up if you're holding it, and you're you're speculating on it surviving. You know, whatever challenges lie ahead. Now, that's not to say they're going to happen or they have to happen. It's just, I mean, look at the history of crypto. It's been a pretty rocky road. Well, um, let's move on and talk about the uh, something. Chris is something something you're a little more uh, intimate with. Uh, the Open Bazaar Alpha is released. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So you you've been you put a lot of work into this, getting the the next evolution of the Open Bazaar platform out there. Yeah, this is the uh, 2.0 version that we've been working on for it seems like ages, and uh, it's 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 working pretty good. We've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback. Um, we've addressed. Uh, most of the significant issues that we had in 1.0, um, there are a couple features that we we aren't going to be able to get into the, I guess the first production release that'll have to come in the coming months after that. Um, one in, one big one relating to like product discovery, but um, uh, but other than that, the platform seems to be pretty stable. I haven't had a whole lot of issues with it. IPFS is working pretty spectacularly at this point, and. Uh, and so we'll just see, I guess, you know, as more people get on the network and as there's more and more people, how, how stable it is. But I'm pretty confident it'll be stable because the main IPFS network has tons of users already. Um, and that's pretty stable. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect to see a whole lot of difference, uh, you know, with ours. Yeah. So uh, part of the, the IPFS thing that y- you were talking about last time we had you on was the fact that some of these stores, the old way... You pretty much have to run your your node basically in order for your store to stay online. But now you've solved that problem with the IPFS. Now now the stores are able to be perpetually open. Is that right? For the most part, yeah. The the content your store content is um, seeded similar to uh, like if you're seeding files on BitTorrent. Um, so technically, if you're the only seeder and then you go offline, then yeah, your store data is not going to be available um, for other people to download. But um, Every time someone visits your store, they they will download and cache and seed your data as well. So if like you get a hundred people visiting your store, that's a hundred other people seeding it. Um, and then you might have like crawlers and stuff that will crawl it and pick it up and seed it and and stuff. So um, you know it's it's maybe not a hundred percent guaranteed that your data will be available if you go offline, but we're shooting to get close to that. What's uh, what's sort of the feedback been uh, with this release? Um, people really like the design of it. They like, um, you know, how, how, especially for an alpha version, this, this is pretty, pretty darn close to like being production ready. It's, it's not, not that far out. Um, a few little bugs here or there that we're picking, picking up, but we're, we're really kind of just looking for, um, you know, people to find these little bugs so we can fix them and get them ready, you know, for the beta, which will probably be on, on the Bitcoin main net, the, the beta version. Um, but uh, overall, I think people seem to be pretty impressed with it, and I'm, I'm pretty happy. Excellent. And where can people find out about Open Bazaar? Uh, you can go to openbazaar.org. Um, 
I guess uh, the the I guess the official release will probably be happening in September. Well, definitely will be happening in September. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's September first or first week of September. I guess that's to be determined. But sure. Um, but yeah, if, in in September sometime, you can check out the new version. Wow, excellent! It's great to hear. And we're also going to have a video on our website for you to, to, to see it if you wish. Uh, NeoCashRadio.com will have a link to a video uh, showing that. Uh, moving on to other news stories here. So uh, we've uh, talked about the Ignis token sale because I've interviewed um, Lior Yaffe, the core dev. The Jalurida, Jalurida, it's a fun name to say, Ignis token sale started earlier this week with a quickness. The first two rounds of 5 million Jalurida tokens were sold instantly to one buyer. Reddit was, was awash with upset and annex tears. There were more than a couple hyperbolic posts proclaiming the ICO a disaster. Next came a message from the NXT address that bought the tokens, informing people that he or she had spent a lot of time learning about the NXT API, had created a method to listen uh, to the sale signal, and instantly send a buy transaction. More laments from the potential participants. Well, Lior and the team at Jalurida snapped into action and released an updated client version 1.11.7, which allows participants to create a buy order before the tokens are released. This is even the playing field even more. Now the quick buyers are setting up their transactions as higher priority by upping the fee and running Hallmark nodes and two continents. In each case, someone has studied the protocol and software and found ways to optimize. They devoted time and energy to figuring out the system and adapting. These sorts of individuals ought to be congratulated rather than condemned. Innovation and resourcefulness are rewarded in nearly every other part of our society. Regardless of the distribution, the ICO has started out well for Jalurida. It'll be fun to watch what they can do with some solid funding. But this brings up an important topic. How do you distribute an ICO evenly and broadly? It seems that any coin or token worth owning will be sniped by whales and pools, limit the transaction size, and savvy buyers will figure out a way to send an array of transactions, limit the buying address, and clever folks will figure out a way to create many new addresses. Seems like the more effort you put into even distribution, the more network congestion will be caused by the brute force efforts to, efforts to grab those tokens. So this is sort of the, the general idea of how do you set how do you distribute a limited number of tokens fairly and broadly so yeah that, that's a good question how can we throttle these token sales in a way that makes it more evenly distributable like maybe some type of randomization i don't know if the you know code in in ether will allow that at, at this point but these are all good points because like the goal of uh initial coin offering is that you you're raising money and you're doing it in a way that's much more fair than uh you know ipos but um it's not fair if a big whale goes in there and snatches up all the tokens yeah it it, it does it's it's like it's a tough nut to crack well, it seems to be a little bit of a limitation of the ethereum model right because there, there are well, other this ways is, this is nxt this is a different blockchain completely okay. but well, if you're doing the sale yes. directly on a blockchain i i guess i mean there are other kind of ways to do it like if you look at the recent file coin where they're they're doing this like accredited sale and uh you know that they're kind of like picking and choosing who they're allowing to invest and and not invest at this point um which is not just the way other tokens are doing it on ethereum where they just send ether to an address and get some right. tokens back yeah well it it just seems like there, there's some creativity that needs to happen in this space in order for that to to actually be more of an egalitarian model but you know what the token sales people aren't aren't really complaining because you know as, yeah, as yeah. we'll talk about later in the episode the the funding from icos is rising rapidly yes and the the people selling the tokens you know it's you know they're they're happy to get the funding but yeah you know, how how do you bring fairness yeah uh, Pedro, you got a story here. Why don't you uh, tell us about what Fidelity is in the news again? Yeah, in the news today, this is from Reuters.com. Um, Fidelity Investments has started allowing clients to use its website to view their holdings of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies held through digital wallet provider Coinbase, the company said on Wednesday. The initiative, previously tested with the Boston-based money manager's employees, is a rare example of an established financial services company warming up to cryptocurrencies. Starting Wednesday, August 9th, most Fidelity clients will be able to authorize Coinbase, one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the United States, to provide the fund manager with data on their holdings. 
It seems like a pretty big uh, move forward for Fidelity. Yeah, so why would they do this? Um, so I'm thinking um, this gets them into uh, the game, right? It, it's a traditional money manager uh, now is is being well-known amongst the, the crypto crowd. And as the regulators start allowing things like crypto ETFs and mutual funds and other investment vehicles, they're really well positioned to, you know, maybe say, hey, all, all these people that made a lot of money in in, in crypto, well, now it's very easy. We're all integrated with Coinbase. You can send your coins there and, and use them to buy our funds. Or maybe they'll have their own crypto funds and, and use that marketing. So I see it as an early play for, for a very big investment company. This is not a small company at all. No, it isn't. Um, and, and then linking up, you know, with, with Coinbase, of course, you've got another established company in the, uh, the, the crypto sphere that has you know, uh, uh, not only experience, but you know, a reputation of their own. And, uh, you know, it's it seems like... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, Coinbase has gone through all of the legal hurdles. They're a regulated, you know, company. They play by all the all the regulated rules. So, uh, you know, I, I couldn't see the Fidelity going with a, a small company like a BTCE, for example. Uh, they're going with somebody that has gone through all the legal uh, hurdles. Wow. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing I think Fidelity brings to the table in this sort of situation is the fact that they are also very well knowledge and well experienced in dealing with regulations and regulators and licensing and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, and it could potentially open up um, a vehicle for a lot of institutional money to flow into crypto. Yeah. Well, earlier this week, I released a swap protocol interview with Don Mositas and Michael Oved. On Monday, I published the interview with the founders of the Swap Protocol. Don and Michael joined me to discuss how the protocol works and made an announcement regarding AirSwap. AirSwap will be the platform, a platform running the Swap Protocol. The Air, their token, Air, will be launched during the token sale on October 10th. Their goal is to create as little as friction as possible with atomic swaps, peer-to-peer -peer atomic swaps. They hope to accomplish this by keeping the price haggling off the blockchain and having a no-fee model. So rather than pay a fee for each swap, each user will have to hold about $10 worth of air tokens in their wallet. This membership model is something new, and I'm excited to see how it will work out. So it, as far as no friction goes, Pedro, it's like I just need to hold these tokens and I can use their platform. Yeah, no friction is awesome. That's, yeah. that's really good. I mean, they were trying to figure out how they're going to fund. You know, it's like, well, if we don't charge a fee, you know, if, if we don't sell the, the platform, right, then how do you make money? So this is the the sort of membership model, and I, I'll be interested to see how it works out. Now, the swap protocol is something that you could probably expect to see in wallets right next to your Shapeshift. And like Shapeshift, it's a peer to it's a one to one exchange. You and your your swapper are are exchanging, and that is all handled in the. Uh, the the swap protocol and and basically it it's it takes all of the the price haggling and and it happens offline and the only thing that actually happens online is the contract with the swap so there isn't much network congestion with this sort of model yeah. i mean shapeshift has been around for a while and they're very successful they're coming out with innovative products so it's only a matter of time before uh, competition comes there and and speaking of shapeshift uh, now, if you go to Overstock as of as of this week, um, you can check out with over forty different cryptos. They've uh, integrated the Shapeshift. Um, re it's, it's a retail API. So right in the checkout, you can say Bitcoin or other uh, crypto, and then it integrates with Shapeshift so that it Shapeshifts on the back end and gives Overstock their money. Wow! So yeah. really, and really they're keeping like fifty percent of the Bitcoin they get too, right? They're they're just investing it. I, I think they're they're paying they're trying to pay people. They're offering. They I know in the past they've offered to pay people in Bitcoin, and then you know they're also OX, right? Isn't that their 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 trading platform T they're making? T zero. T zero. I'm sorry. T zero. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> oh, zero X. T zero. Uh, y Y alpha. I mean, what's next? <laughs> um, double J. Why not? <laughs> All right, so we've got a story. ICO funding for blockchain projects will soon surpass venture, venture capital funding. July was a record-breaking month for ICOs with over $540 million raised. Coindesk reports that blockchain projects have now raised a total of $1.67 billion in the brief history of the ICOs. 
just shy of the $1.8 billion that has been raised for the sector by venture capital firms. ICOs have obviously had a huge impact on the fintech sector this year, bringing large amounts of capital into startups and growing businesses. I expect we'll be talking more about ICOs in future episodes of Neocash Radio, as they're clearly an important mechanism by which blockchain technology is radically disrupting and decentralizing the worlds of technology, business, and investing, and also gambling. <laughs> not, not, not just speculating on a coin, but actually gambling, too. Yeah. Uh, and the um, we're we're seeing this too in the um, I guess the VC space. Like some of them are really getting into investing in tokens, um, and part of this is because you know people who are looking to raise money are not really kind of going to them and asking for money. So we we had a conference call um, with uh, Chris Dixon, who's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Right, this is a really large VC yeah. firm, and. Um, you know, Chris Dixon was like, you know, we we did not get pitched by any Ethereum projects at all, like zero, right? N- none of them came to us and, and pitched, and it's because they're all doing tokens. And so, like, these VCs are, are starting to kind of worry a little bit. Maybe, like, this new fundraising model might, like, take away their business. And so now some of them are, I know, like, USV has been pretty proactive in going out and investing in actual tokens and encouraging their portfolio companies to issue tokens and, and this sort of stuff. So it's, um, it, it's, it, it's not just changing, uh, you know, that landscape, but also like traditional VCs as well. Yeah. You know, in, in, a, in a way it almost seems like tokens are just the flavor of the month right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this is a really long month. You know, like, Yeah. And I, you know, my thing is, you know, we haven't had like a single token actually succeed at this point yet. Right. I mean, I, I suppose some people have bought into them and they've gone up a little bit and cashed out. Maybe that's a win for those people. But I mean, not anything on like the order that, um, you know, VCs would be looking at for an investment with maybe the exception of Ethereum. Um, but Ethereum, it's, you know, it, it's like a it's almost like a platform for tokens to some extent. Right. So it's in terms of, um, you know, any like app that's actually incorporating one of these tokens actually taking off. It hasn't really happened. Right. And I mean, we are, I'm definitely tracking that actively. And, and what, what I see happening first, it would be the, uh, the de- debit card tokens be, being the first ones to actually do something because the, the debit card is one of those ubiquitous things that so many people are used to using in their everyday life. And as soon as you can spend your crypto with it, that's sort of like the beginning of that, that closed loop. Um, so uh, why don't you, you've got a story about WikiLeaks here, Pedro. Why don't we talk about that? Yeah, so uh, from ethnews.com, uh, Wik- WikiLeaks is now accepting uh, Zcash. So uh, WikiLeaks has been uh, accepting cryptocurrency since 2011 when uh, a banking blockade attempted to cut off the nonprofit from its revenue. Uh, WikiLeaks will now accept the selective, quote, selectively transparent, unquote, cryptocurrency Zcash which incorporates advanced cryptography to hide information about the sender, the receiver, or transaction amounts. Zcash is now the third cryptocurrency to be accepted by WikiLeaks behind Bitcoin and Litecoin. Zcash employs a specific cryptographic methodology called ZK-SNARK, a form of zero-knowledge cryptography, which allows the data of a transmission to be concealed. This means that people seeking to donate to WikiLeaks can send a transaction without anyone ever being able to see who sent it or how much something that WikiLeaks may find advantageous to provide to supporters as its time goes on. Right. Yeah, I mean, this this definitely coincides with WikiLeaks' need for, uh, well, both getting donations, but also helping those people that want to donate find a way to sort of protect themselves from whatever ire the, the, their local government has against WikiLeaks. Um, so good stuff there, and, and, and always... You know, it's it's sort of like this story because WikiLeaks has such a international uh, brand. You know, this sort of story will maybe help the uh, the Zcash and and crypto uh, get into more eyes and ears. But anyway, Michael, you've got a, an update for us here. For uh, what do you got? Yeah, this just came out today. The BTCE exchange that was shut down by the U.S. government, I believe, a week ago or two weeks ago, put out an update number five. Uh, they've been putting them out in Russian, and this is the one that's been widely discussed today, and I, I did my own scan and my own translation of it, and it's got a lot of information, and I can read it to you. Sure. Uh, what I typed. 
pretty much in my notes yeah so the first uh, the brand name btc will not be used because it's uh, it's under investigation by the us government and fincen and things like that uh, but the people behind it are trying to find an investment firm to take over the operations and relaunch the service because they want to pay the debts to the clients uh, so it will not be called btce but they're trying to find somebody find somebody to run the operations okay uh, the good news, 55% of the funds um, are in control uh, by the BDC owners, uh, and that's mostly cryptos. As we know, the fiat flows were arrested, and okay. I think all that money was confiscated. But 55% of the funds is available, mostly in crypto. 45% was taken by the U.S. government. Um, wow. Yeah. So the, so the U.S. government basically took uh, the fiat and... and some crypto or, or sounds some, like it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like, wow. It, yeah. What, a, what a haircut. Yeah. Yeah. They found a few servers. I believe they shut them down. I forget the location. Uh, some country. Okay. <laughs> uh, was it Canada? Maybe it was Canada or th- someplace. Um, so 55% of the funds is available as crypto. So they're going to pay that back to the owners. Now for the remaining 45% that they owe the owners, the clients, they're going to do what Bitfinex, Bitfinex, Bitfinex did. Okay. They are going to create a token um, which will be tradable and which will represent uh, $1 worth of value. They're going to call it BTE and they're going to assign it to those people who, well, they're going to assign it to everybody right. for the 45% of their funds owed. Okay. It worked out for Bitfinex. Um, I believe they paid everything back. So that's good news. Um, so for the people who had fiat, uh, fiat um, uh, what is interesting, the 55% of the value will be paid in seven different cryptocurrencies. Wow. Uh, Give me yeah. a basket of crypto. <laughs> Equal amounts, they say. It's not completely clear what they stated, but it looks like they're going to, so people are going to get BT, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash, Ether, and Namecoin, and something else. Uh, so the people who had fiat. Right. In their accounts. The, owner, the people who had crypto will get that crypto. Okay. Yeah, 55% of that crypto. Um, what else? Yeah, KYC, AML, everything will be followed. ID checking will be done. New verifications by this new company that's going to take over. Wow. And yeah, they're targeting uh, end of August for the, all this to begin. So that's good news. Yeah, that's <laughs> good news for the people with money stuck on BTCE or formerly known as BTCE. Right, it's very good news because they, they could have very well said, well, yeah, we're under investigation. They took it all. Yeah, sorry. you know, and, But they're not doing that. So that this is very good to hear. Yeah, they've been in the business for a while, I believe six years. And so far, I didn't hear any complaints from people. Well, uh, so, we'll, I mean, obviously this whole, the funds seized and, and whatnot, whatever arrests made, obviously the, the, the whole court process, we probably won't find out much about this for six or eight months. And then, we'll, then by then, we'll have forgotten about it. But the people who are missing out on money, um, is there a place that they can go, or is it just sort of waiting for the next owners to take over? Nothing yet. This is the update they put out. Again, they put them in Russian. They put these blurbs every couple of days. They put them on the Bitcoin forum, Bitcoin talk forum, and on Twitter. And they say, if you get any news from anywhere else, it's all fake. So don't click on any links other than, that, than those. Okay. Well, hey, thanks for that update, Michael. Sure. All right, one last story here, wrap up the show. So it's the debit card showdown, and I've already spoken a little bit about this. We've talked about token card, Monaco, and 10x debit cards many times on Neocash Radio. Speaking for myself, I see as debit cards as a fundamental element for creating the closed loop of crypto personal banking. Many people are fortunate enough to be paid in cryptocurrencies around the world. The issue has always been spending that money on everyday expenses. This is where the debit card fills that gap, truly allowing someone to earn crypto and pay for everyday expenses. Centra is conducting their token sale right now, CTR token. They, too, are using the Ethereum blockchain. The big difference between Centra and the other cards we mentioned is U.S. availability. Centra claims they already have access to U.S. markets. Their white paper mentions the U.S. residents will receive a Visa card, while all the other countries will receive a MasterCard. Just like the others mentioned, there is a wallet that goes along with the card, and this wallet will support... Ethereum, Bitcoin, Litecoin, ERC20 tokens, Dash, Ripple, Zcash, and Monero. Like 10x, they have a currency conversion engine, though it looks like it will function differently than commit channels. 
Each, uh, like each of the other cards, there are rewards with usage and holding the CTR token. The level of rewards depends on which tier of the card you get. Their white paper, paper claims they are holding licenses in 38 states. These licenses are held under the categories of money transmitter, sales of checks, electronic money transfers, and seller of payment instruments. New Hampshire is one of those states. So this is big news here for the United States market. Uh, Because all the other cards have have been, to this date, if you are a U.S. citizen, we can't help you yet. We'll maybe be able to help you by the end of the year. And so this is the first card that would be available to U.S. residents. And from my understanding is that they've already got something in the works. And this is not a new company. They've been working on this for about a year and a half now. And I am I reached out to them and asked for an interview, so we'll see if they uh, want to come on Neocash Radio and tell me about their stuff. But as far as, uh, you know, getting your, being able to spend your crypto, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of options out there, and we're just going to let you know which one works out finally when it actually works out. But um, it's... Yeah, a, I mean, this is, I think for these token cards, the, you know, time to market is going to be important. It's going to be which one of, of these companies are, are going to be able to get through all the regulators and, and get the approval to, to go, and then they're going to have a, a market advantage. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, that's the, yes, the world market is way bigger than the United States, uh, and so the cards out there that are already running, the 10X card, and, uh, and I, there's a couple others that aren't as prominent, but, you know, that they're, they're, they're in good positions, but the, the U.S. market just, for whatever reason, has a tremendous amount of disposable, <laughs> disposable income. And will really use the heck out of these cards. So, um, I mean, uh, what about you guys? Do you, to just a, sort of a, an informal survey, do you do each of you spend crypto on a on a regular basis to to buy things? Not that often, to be honest. Um, certainly, as the transaction Bitcoin fees have been going up, I've been doing a lot less, right? Um, but I, it, if it's if it's like if I'm going, I don't know, Dancing Lion or somewhere around here, Pizza 911 that takes bit Bitcoin, usually I do. Um, although I was more likely to do it when fees were $0.10 cents and not $3 or, you know, when they went up that high. Um, sometimes I'll buy stuff on Overstock, but, you know, we're, we're kind of still at like a shortage of places where you can actually spend it. So it's not a whole whole lot of opportunities. Right. Hey, you, you, what about you, Michael? Yeah, um, online, little, a little, very little anymore, because once I realize the value of Bitcoin, I don't want to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah. that, that is a real issue. <laughs> well, you know what I, what I would always do, even when fees were lower and I was spending it more, is I'd, I'd, I'd like buy it right back on Coinbase, that whatever I spent, you know, so if I spent 10 bucks, I'd just go on my Coinbase app and hit like instant buy for 10 bucks. And so it was kind of like I was not actually losing any Bitcoin balance that way. That is, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I have not done that, so I blame myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do probably uh, two or three uh, a, a week. Um, you know, Overstock is one. Uh, Amazon's another. Uh, but you have to go through an intermediary. I use uh, Gift, uh, so you can you know buy Gift with Bitcoin, and then you get that uh, Amazon gift card, and you apply it to your Amazon account and and buy stuff with Amazon. Uh, so if, if you're an Amazon purchaser and you don't mind using one of these third parties, then there you go. I, I think it would be a, a very important day when Amazon accepts it natively. Right. Well, it, it, it's it's one of those things where the day that you can go up to a gas pump and you can just swipe your card and get gas without ever interacting with, you know, and paying it for crypto and then going and, and then, in, well, here in, in Manchester, we are the fortunate that there is a property manager here who does accept crypto for rents at uh as just just at large you know <clears throat> oh yeah when i was renting from from matt i um i yeah. paid him bitcoin I, I i don't i'm I'm at a different place now so i don't, I don't but yeah i was paying rent in bitcoin and, and, for a and while there's a, there's a fair amount of of people we know that do rent and pay in bitcoin i mean i i can count on you know fill up one hand with people i know that have done that so it's good stuff yeah, yeah. Well, it's exciting to see the developments, and thank you both, uh, gentlemen, for coming on the show. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. And Michael, thank you again. Thank you. And congratulations on your new show. I really uh, bright stuff ahead for you guys. And Pedro, thank thank you for joining when Darren couldn't. Yeah, I always love being here when <laughs> I can. All right, for Neo Cash Radio, this is JJ and Pedro, and you can tune in every Wednesday for more Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. <laughs>